Good morning. I want to welcome you. Would like to ask you to find a seat, you know. If you want to find one of these first rows, that'd be great. Good morning, my name is Jonathan. I am glad that we are gathered here to worship. I'm super excited. I do not know how everyone came in this morning. Maybe you're joyfully content, or possibly you're in a season where you are just thirsting for more than what life has currently given. Um, we are all here, and yes, we made it, but some of us are saying, but just barely, we've given all that we have. Well, there is good news for us this morning in Isaiah 55. During this time, God is speaking to a discouraged people in captivity whose future is uncertain and who are going through various troubles. It states, come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what, on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler, and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you not know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, is also the lamb that was slain so that we may be pardoned. And he invites all who are thirsting for more, who have nothing left to give, who have sinned, to come to him and find freedom, forgiveness, and to freely worship him. Hallelujah. Let's worship our amazing God this morning. Let's pray. Father, we worship you for who you are. We come with all that we have, and, and when all that we have is nothing, you still say, come, come and drink, come and eat. And so we come this morning in the power of the Holy Spirit to worship you, Jesus, the root of David, the lion and the lamb. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship together. King of kings 
captives free For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb, oh, every knee will bow before Him. Let's lift our praise to Him. And who can stop the Lord Almighty? Stop the Lord Almighty, and who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Let's see that again. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. Sound great a tear 
At this time in the service, we affirm an ancient creed. Uh, it's called the Apostles' Creed. And it's a set of beliefs that mark all of the different things that Christians believe. Um, and this is a creed that's been in place for thousands of years. It dates back to the second century. Christians would actually use these beliefs to declare what was true uh, in the midst of so much untruth uh, that they were surrounded by in the world. And so, um, thanks, Lawrence. I actually need this. Um, when they would get baptized or when they were approaching a test of their faith in martyrdom, Christians would recite this creed to remember and proclaim what was true in the midst of all sorts of untruth. And we, we live in a world of untruth today. Um, Oftentimes, we hear untruths like you have to work yourself down to the bone to be accepted, uh, or you are alone and not worthy of love. You can never be more than your greatest failures. We recite this creed as an act of resistance to all of that untruth. We, we declare what is true this morning. So let's do that together by reciting uh, in one voice the Apostles' Creed. Let's see if we can get it on the screen. There we go. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Um, and before we continue with our worship, we're going to ask you, turn to someone new that you don't know, uh, introduce yourself. And I was at an event this weekend where there were a lot of great fall dishes, such as soups and chilies. I would love to see a massive recipe swap going on this morning. Tell someone a great fall meal that you've prepared recently.
Okay, good morning. Love to invite you to make your way towards your seats. You could go ahead and find your seats, grab your bulletin. Awesome. Good morning. My name is Melissa Mackey uh, and have a few announcements for us. But again, I would encourage you to grab a bulletin if you got a hard copy. If not, you can scan the QR code on the pillar. Um, that way you can follow along with some of our announcements. Uh, I want to say a great big welcome to those of you who are visiting or are joining us for the first time. We're so glad that you're here. Um, we want to invite you to stop by the welcome table at the back after the service is over. We have a gift for you. Uh, also some folks that would love to, to help you get connected to the life of the church. The other way to do that, and we would encourage any one of you who haven't ever filled out our Get Connected card before, um, we would love to have you do that. You can do that through a link in the bulletin. You can also do that by tearing off the card at the bottom. This just helps us know, uh, to help you get connected, know what might, um, yeah, what, how you can get plugged in to the church. Um, so please take a minute and do that if you haven't before. Okay, so our fall ministry season is in full swing. Uh, we've gotten started the last couple weeks with our community groups. Um, some of our classes and cohorts have launched, uh, but it's not too late to get involved. So we really want to invite uh, all of you to, be, to participate in some of our discipleship opportunities this fall. Uh, if you've not yet joined a community group, if you're not plugged into one, if you don't know how, uh, we would really love to, to help you get connected to one nearby you. So you can, again, stop by the table in the back. Um, we'll help you get connected to a community group. You can also check that in the Get Connected form. Um, we've also, like I said, launched some other things for discipleship for this fall. So some of that has been through our Holy Trinity Institute. You've heard me talk about this a lot. I'm going to give a little bit more plug this morning. Um, because there's still opportunity and there are some deadlines coming up. So we have our courses, which are basically eight-week offerings, and we do those in kind of a semester rotation. We had one start this past Monday online uh, in Monday evenings, um, and that's, that's been great. We also have had um, cohorts start. Now, our cohorts are more like uh, cover the course of an academic year. So they're a little bit more intensive. Uh, they meet uh, over the course of a year as opposed to just in eight-week increments. Um, so there are a few of those that are still uh, available. There are some deadlines, again, coming up, so I just want to make sure you know about that. As far as uh, courses, um, there's still one coming up. It'll be our Sunday morning in-person class. It's going to start in two weeks. It happens on the fifth floor, and that one is called uh, Missional Ecclesiology, The Church and the Mission of God. Um, we're really excited about that one. Again, it'll last eight weeks. It happens at 9 a.m. here. Uh, the deadline to sign up for that is October 14th. So please make sure that you do that. And if you need childcare, that'll be available. But the sooner you could sign up and let us know, the sooner we can make arrangements for that to happen. So that's the course that's still out there to sign up for. But really what I want to draw your attention to, and this is in the bulletin, uh, that there are two cohorts that are still available. Again, these are a little bit more intensive. They meet over the course of the year. Uh, the first one is called the Chicago Plan. If you are interested in vocational ministry, if that's something that you're exploring or just kind of wondering, wanting to learn more about, we invite you to check out and apply for the Chicago Plan. You can find that um, by scanning the QR code uh, here on, on this or through our website as well. That's the Chicago Plan. The other cohort that is also starting up in a couple weeks is called our Culture and Theology Intensive. And I keep talking about this, but I really am so excited about this cohort. It's, it's brand new. It's just going to be six sessions. It happens once a month. So it's not, it's not a lot of your time, but I think it'll be really worth it. It'll happen Friday nights over the course of October through April. It'll be in here. We'll have tables set up. We're going to do dinner. There will be childcare. There will also be um, activities for, for youth. And so we really see this as like a family event on Friday nights, once a month, to come together, eat dinner together. And we're going to um, dig into a topic that I think is really vital right now. We're going to talk about <clears throat> the family of God and gender and sexuality. So we're going to dig into some, some things that I think are really culturally important for us to engage with and understand how to think about biblically. We're also going to talk about how do we do that as, as a family. What does it mean to be single, married, male, female, same-sex attracted, to be part of the family of God? How do we talk about this together? So these are going to be some awesome conversations, I think, around the table, again, over dinner. Um, and I just, I have this sense that um, we need the body to all be present for these conversations because we want to talk about, again, what it means for us to live as a family in this culture, in these contexts. So 
that's my plug for, uh, for all of you. would love to see you there once a month, Friday night. Um, if you have questions, I'm going to be over at that table, the institute table afterwards. would love to talk to you more. Um, but yeah, we'd just really love to offer these discipleship opportunities for you this fall and see everybody plugged in in some way. So we're going to continue our worship service now with our prayer. I'm going to invite Chad and Stephanie up. Thanks. Pray with us. God, you are sovereign over all. We praise you as the giver of all good gifts and the one who holds all things together. Thank you for the beauty of your creation with the changing of the leaves and the shifting of the seasons that remind us that you are the God who is unchanging when the world around us will come and go. Thank you for being a God who knows our hearts and our tendencies and yet still pursues us in love. God, we thank you for the ways you are moving through our church in this season. We thank you for fellowship in our community groups and the opportunity to study your word together. We thank you for the HTC Institute and the ways it has helped equip us as we face the cha challenges in our culture today and how to engage others. We thank you for Kids City and Youth Group and pray that you would continue to demonstrate your love to the young ones in our midst through your word that is alive and moving and the many volunteers serving. We also thank you for bringing David and Carrie to our church family to help lead our youth ministry and pray that their transition to the city would be smooth and that you would bless their ministry. In all of these ministries, Lord, we pray that none would be done by our own efforts and strength, but ask Holy Spirit that you would continue to breathe life into these ministries, that they would be glorifying and honoring to you. God, we also come before you now to confess the ways we have chosen our own way over yours the ways we've sought security in things apart from you and chased after the promises of the world that, fall always, that always fall short. God, would you create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us? In the midst of whatever we may be going through, keep us within your presence. Restore the joy of the gospel within us, the truth that through Christ, we are no longer chained to the hopeless cycle of despair because of our sins, but are chained to the hopeful life with God because of the finished work of Christ. Lord, we see so much brokenness in our city and in our world. And God, we pray that you would be near to those who are mourning or suffering. We especially lift up those in Florida, the Carolinas, and the Caribbean who are displaced by Hurricane Ian and are now in the process of rebuilding their lives. God, would you comfort them in their loss and sadness and provide places for them to stay in the coming days. May you strengthen the churches in affected or surrounding areas to be beacons of hope. May their love and charity be marked by your love. God, we also think of the brokenness in our own city and neighborhoods. We pray for the homeless as the nights get colder, that you would provide shelter and resources for them to be safe. And God, we pray that you would mobilize our church to serve those in need. Reveal to us how we can be the hands and feet of Christ on our blocks. And Lord, as we continue to worship today, we think of the churches across our city who are gathering right now or later today. May you bless their time together and may it be honoring to you. We thank you for the diversity within the church that reflects you, God. Be with Soli as he brings us the word. May you speak through him that we may hear from you today. In Christ's precious name we pray, amen. Amen. Uh, it's at this time kids, ages three through fifth grade are dismissed for Kid City. Uh, so you guys can work your way to the back. And while they're doing that, let's go ahead and stand together as we continue in worship. Let's sing before the throne. Before the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. Can't bid me that deep heart. When 
Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. A word I look and see him there, made an end to all my sin. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. Our scripture reading can be found in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 15, verses 12 to 34. Again, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 34. All right. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people are most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each is in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, 
when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says, all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in, why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thanks, Emily. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Holy Trinity Church. I'm Sully, I'm one of the pastors here at HTC. And before I get started, uh, I wanted to mention where Pastor John is this morning. Uh, some of you who have been around for a little while know that when Holy Trinity Church was first planted, the first congregation was down in Hyde Park. And up until 2020, we were a congregation of, uh, actually four congregations, one church. And we decided, even before 2020, actually 2019, that we were going to multiply out, uh, that Hyde Park was going to be planted as a separate independent church. And uh, they did that in 2020, became Christ Church uh, down in Woodlawn. And uh, we're so thankful for them. And today, they are celebrating by dedicating uh, a new building uh, for their church. So John is actually there today uh, helping with that service. Uh, so he sends his greetings to you. But I invite you all to be praying uh, for our sister church, our brothers and sisters down at Christ Church uh, down in Woodlawn. Well, today, uh, I want to begin with this question. I'm, I'm not sure how many of you may, may know this uh, YouTube channel called News Network for Good News. Uh, it was started back in March of 2020 by the actor John Krasinski. He started posting these videos that he called Some Good News. And it was kind of this joke kind of news show. Uh, but all he did was tell some good news. He thought that, man, the pandemic had hit. All people want to hear is just a little bit of good news. And man, did we tune in. In just a week, that YouTube channel had over uh, 1.5 million subscribers. And his videos called Some Good News had over 25 million views. I don't know if you remember, but man, we were desperate at that time for some good news. I mean, we would watch news that would just tell us about some pets who have a really, like friendship together. And we'd think that was like worth our watching because it was just a little glimpse of good news in a world where it seemed like there was just bad news coming at us left and right. I think we now live in a world where uh, we are having to learn our limits. As we continue to have this diet of bad news, we hear of war, we hear of famine, we hear of natural disasters like a hurricane, we, we hear of uh, political infighting, and we just continue to actually almost be shaped by this constant diet of bad news. It causes us to live, I think, with this kind of this low-grade, constant uh, anxiety, or maybe not so low-grade anxiety. Uh, it shapes how we think, how we think about the world. It shapes our imagination. So much so that I think that because of living in a world where we're constantly taking in all of this bad news, that it's easier for us to believe bad news when we hear it than it is for us to believe good news when we hear it. I think it's easier for us when we hear news about something terrible that's happening in another part of the world and we just accept it. We, we, we're like, yeah, of course. But if we hear good news, well, isn't our first reaction kind of be a little skeptical? Well, maybe. Maybe that's true. It's because we're constantly being shaped and formed by this diet of bad news. It's easier for us to accept bad news than good news. It's no wonder then when we come to a chapter like 1 Corinthians, when we're talking about something fantastic, good news of the resurrection, 
that we approach it maybe with a little bit of hesitation, a little bit of doubt, a little bit of skepticism. There's, uh, there's really two people in the world. There's people who read books and people who wait for the movie to be made of the book. I'm definitely a part of that group that waits for the movie to be made. But recently, I've, I've actually gone back. And I've, up to this point, I've never actually read any of the Harry Potter books. Uh, but I've been recently listening to them. And I've been uh, thinking a lot this week as I've been preparing for uh, preaching on Sunday. This scene in the first book in the Harry Potter series where Harry Potter, we're told, grew, grew up in this home where he didn't know that he was a wizard. And he grew up with this aunt and uncle who just hated him. His life was miserable. He lived in a little room or a little closet underneath the stairs. And on his 11th birthday, everything changed. He found out not only that there were people out in the world that cared for him, he found out that he was a wizard and the world was full of magic and adventure. And the very next day, it says he woke up, but he didn't want to open his eyes. He didn't want to open his eyes because he didn't want to find out that all of that great news that he had heard was just a dream. He didn't want to wake up thinking, oh, that, that, what I just experienced could not be true. It's almost too good to be true. This morning, I, I want to invite us to, to open up our eyes a bit and actually embrace and see the, that the resurrection, it's good news. And it's not just some fantasy, some dream that we tell ourselves, but it's fact. And it's something that we can hang on to. So this morning, this good news of the resurrection is such good news that I want to ask the Lord for his help in explaining it. So would you pause with me for a minute and, uh, and pray? Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the goodness of the gospel. Lord, we thank you that in a world where it seems like we're just constantly taking in discouraging news, bad news, things that cause us to always live with, with anxiety, Lord, I, I pray today that we would once again be reminded of the steadfastness and the pervasiveness of the goodness of the gospel. Lord, this week as we come before this text, we, we know all the, you know all the things that are on our heart, the things that we're thinking about in the coming days, and I pray that you would be able to speak to us. Give us ears, Lord, to hear. Father, I, I love the people in this room, but I know that your love is so much better, so much greater for these people. And so I ask now on behalf of us all that, Lord, you would teach us and grow us and shape us. Help us, Lord, to leave this space with a greater amazement, greater confidence, and greater joy and hope in the resurrection. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Back in July of this last year, a winning lottery ticket was sold in the northern suburbs of Chicago. The winner claimed $1.337 billion jackpot. Crazy amount. If by chance that was you, I'm free for lunch. I'd love to buy you lunch. Or maybe you should buy me lunch. It's funny how, how we can sometimes think about, all of us have thought about what it would be like to win the lottery. We would think about how our life would change and how amazing of news that would be to hear that you won the mega lottery. But your chances, sadly, are 300 times more likely this year to be struck by lightning than it is to win the lottery. And yet, we still find it kind of fun to let our minds wander to what it would be like to get such incredible news. I want to give you uh, permission today to let your mind wander a little bit today to how amazing it is that we have been told that death is not the end. I want your mind to wander to the very fact that the resurrection, like I said, is not fantasy, but it's fact. It's news that's so good that it's actually it's hard for us to grasp, hard for us to comprehend. So today, as we walk through our passage that talks about this good news of the resurrection, I want to do two things. I want to break our, passages in, our passage into two halves. And in the first half, verses 12 through 28, I want, to, I want to address two objections that we have to the resurrection. And then in the second half, I want to address really two habits to cultivate confidence in the resurrection. So one is more reacting to some of the objections, hesitations, and skepticism we have. And then in the second half, I want to talk about two things we can do to be proactive, to be cultivating confidence in the resurrection. Two objections, two habits. That's where we're going. Keep your Bibles open in front of you, and I want to go back and I want to reread verse 12, and our passage begins with a question. It reads, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection? This question doesn't come out of the blue. It's not just a, a randomly uh, put down here in the middle of this chapter. 
we actually last week uh, began to read a little bit about Paul introducing the topic of the resurrection. And actually, we've been working our way through this letter to the church in Corinth. And if you've been with us for a while, you know that problems in Corinth were as plentiful as pigeons are on Wabash. I mean, you can't walk outside without feeling like a pigeon's going to fly in your face. So it was in Corinth. They had problems everywhere. They had issues so plentiful that Paul decided to write this letter, and the way he would organize it was just by going through issue after issue. The, if you actually let your eyes skim through the book, you'll find this phrase, now concerning, and he just moves on to another topic. Now concerning this topic, now concerning this topic. And I think he saves one of the most important topics for us, most important issues and problems going on in Corinth, to this almost uh, the end of the book, uh, chapter 15. There's only one more chapter after this. And it's this issue of their confidence in the resurrection. As we get to chapter 15, it's, it's one of the, honestly, it's one of the greatest chapters in, in all of Scripture. I know we, all of Scripture is amazing, but chapter 15 is just this incredible passage where, where Paul writes to us about the confidence we can have in the resurrection, the hope that it brings us in the present. He talks about what we can expect as we long for the resurrection. I don't know if you have any, uh, any quick ways of answering the question if someone comes up to you and asks, what, what is the gospel? What do you believe? Well, I, I think it's really helpful to have a couple of passages in Scripture that I just have tucked away with me uh, that I know that I can go to and just have a quick, simple explanation of the gospel. And chapter 15 is one of those places that I go to often. Last week when we began looking at chapter 15, we read about how Paul reminded them of what they first believed, the, the kind of the foundational facts of the gospel. He tells us that Christ died according to the scriptures so that we might be saved from our sins and that he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. He then goes on in the very beginning of chapter 15 to begin actually talking about why they can have confidence in this detail about the resurrection. He, he tells them, hey, if you, if you doubt this, go, go check out the 500 or so people that he appeared to or, or look at my own life, how my own life has been transformed by the gospel and, and by the truth of his resurrection. It's no wonder then when we turn to verse 12 that we really begin to see why Paul is talking about the resurrection so much. As we come to verse 12, the issue becomes clear. There are some people in the church in Corinth who were beginning to teach that there was no resurrection. That's the issue that we come across in chapter 15 that drives the entire uh, section. You know, we're not really told why uh, there were some people in the church that were beginning to teach this idea that there is no resurrection. Um, but what we, ha what we have before us is that this idea that Corinth was beginning to really wrestle with some of the very basic things that they were told uh, about the gospel, that Christ died for their sins and that he rose again from the dead. A lot of them probably believed this, loved this message. It, it could have very well been that they, they were thinking that a lot more people would come and follow Jesus if they didn't have to believe the resurrection. That's just almost too good to believe. It would be a lot easier for people to come and follow Jesus if they don't have to believe that you know, fantasy that he rose from the dead or that we have to believe that, that people are going to rise again someday. For Paul, though, without resurrection, there is no good news. And so he stresses here in our passage today how central the resurrection is to our faith. You know, anyone who tells you that you can have a Chicago dog without mustard is a heretic, right? I mean, you don't have mustard, you don't have a Chicago dog. So it is with the gospel. If you don't have the resurrection, you don't have good news. I told you this morning that I want to address two objections that we have to the resurrection. And I think that the first objection that I want to address today it really is, is a matter not so much of disbelief, but simple apathy. I think some of us object to believing in the resurrection because we just wonder, does it, does it really make a difference for me right now? Yeah, it's a great thought for the future, but does it really have any immediate implications for me? What's the point in believing in it? Well, in this uh, section of our passage, Paul does a bit of a thought experiment. He goes on to say, let's take for a moment and say that there is no resurrection. What would be true if that's the case. Look with me. I'm going to read a couple of verses here, starting in verse 13. And look, look here at what Paul says would be true if there is no resurrection. He says, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. 
We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope, in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. It's a pretty stark picture that he paints here, and he lists a ton of different things. So if you're a type A type of person that you like lists, I'm going to give you a list. I'm going to try to summarize here seven things that he says are true about uh, that that would be true if there is no resurrection. He says, first off, if there is no resurrection, then you cannot believe that Christ was raised from the dead. It doesn't make sense then to claim that no one raised from the dead and and still claim that Christ was raised. Two, he says that this preaching, whatever you proclaim, it's in vain. You shouldn't do it. Three, he says your faith in Christ, it's empty. It's useless. There, there would be no point in having faith in Christ. Fourth, we're misrepresenting God. We're telling people, the church, we're telling people that God is great and good and he's raised him from the dead. Well, you're actually misrepresenting God as greater than he really is. Fifth, he says that we are still in our sins if Christ is not raised from the dead. We are still captive to Satan and condemned. Sixth, those who have died, those that we love who have died in Christ, well, there is no hope of ever seeing them again. They have perished. And seventh, he just simply ends by saying, we of all people are foolish and should be of all people most pitied. He paints, yeah, this this pretty dark picture, this picture of reality, if there is no resurrection. And so for us who maybe have this question about what's, what's the point in really actually believing the the resurrection? Is it necessary to be a Christ follower and believe in the resurrection? Well, Paul's answer is this resounding, yes, it absolutely matters. If you reject the idea of the resurrection on the basis that you don't think it really matters, I would would, would join Paul in calling you to rethink that again. That it's actually the resurrection that allows us to have hope in the present, allows us to to, to, to face the challenges of our day uh, with a sense of there's a future, that there's hope, to believe that every day that you wake up that you have a fighting chance against sin that day. It's because of the resurrection. The resurrection has immediate and present ramifications for us. And so for any of us who root maybe a neglect or object to the resurrection because we're not sure what the point is, well, I would have you read that list of things that would be true if there is no resurrection. There's a, a new book that came out this year by a Yale law professor named Anthony Cronman. He grew up in a home that maybe was like yours and that religion was talked about as not just useless, but as dangerous. He grew up thinking that it would, it's not just foolish, but it's a dangerous thing to actually have faith. As he's gotten older, though, he's begun to kind of question things a bit, question his unbelief that was instilled in him from a young age. And He wrote this book that explains his journey a bit. The title of the book is called uh, After Disbelief, On Disenchantment, Disappointment, Eternity, and Joy. In this book, he doesn't really come around to confessing faith in Christ, but he does argue that in a world of, of disenchantment and disillusionment and disappointment, that there is something helpful about believing in eternity. I think he's on to something. Scripture actually says that God has placed within us this sense of eternity, this longing for eternity. While there's a lot that I disagree with or want to question about Cronman's book, I do admire that he was willing to question his unbelief. I think some of you this morning, a big step for you would would begin to maybe question some of your objections to the resurrection. Dismissing or neglecting the resurrection, according to Paul, is it's no small thing. Without the resurrection, there isn't just no good news. It means we're left with meaninglessness and suffering. Well, today, as I said, some of you may object to the resurrection by asking the question, what's the point? There's others of us, though, who might reject the resurrection by asking the question, where's the proof? We want to see the proof. Why should we believe something so crazy as the idea that the dead are going to be raised? We need proof if we're going to believe that. And I'm not going to deny this morning that There's a lot of people 
who have died and who have not been raised back to life. We've seen it. There's a lot of evidence that would point us in the other direction. But if we look at all the data points, it actually isn't so conclusive. Because there is one who has been raised. One who has raised from the dead and who is the first fruits. The one who is this sign of more to come. As we move in our passage to verses 20 through 28, uh, Paul moves from talking about what would be true if there is no resurrection to talking about what is true. What is true that Christ has been raised? One commentator says that a resurrection means endless hope. No resurrection means hopeless end. As he turns this corner, he begins to talk about this endless hope that we have because Christ has been raised. He is the first fruits. He is the proof. As we look through verses 20 uh, through 23, I want you to notice how Paul uses the word first fruits. Again, this is verse 20. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Paul says, you want proof that the dead are going to rise from the grave? Look no further than Christ himself. He's our evidence for believing in such a crazy idea, such as the resurrection. I don't know if you've struggled with asking this question, what, you know, do we, do we really need to believe in the resurrection? Is there any proof for this belief? If that's maybe been a question you've wrestled with in the past, I, I have a book recommendation for you. It's a small little book uh, by Josh McDowell called More Than a Carpenter. And it was a really helpful book for me in college. And there's this particular chapter that he writes, uh, he just calls it, Can You Keep a Good Man Down? And in it, he talks about all the evidence that we have to point to to actually base our belief uh, in the resurrection. And for him, he, he actually concludes that, that the evidence is pretty conclusive that the only viable explanation for the rapid growth of the gospel, the only explanation, rational explanation for the radical devotion of early followers of Christ was that Christ rose from the grave. Here in these couple of verses, Paul uses this word first fruits. And I know we're a long way off from being an agrarian culture, but we can maybe think back to a culture where we would, life would rise and fall with the harvest. In the Old Testament, uh, the people of God were called to, to offer up their first fruits, the first of the harvest, as an, a thankful, uh, an offering of thanksgiving. The reason for this was that the first fruits really were a sign that God was going to provide a full harvest that year. First fruits is this idea that there's more still to come. This summer, I uh, planted a couple of sunflower seeds, just kind of as an experiment. Planted them in mid-May. They began to sprout end of May. June came around, they kept growing. July, they kept growing. Around August, though, they were getting up to be six, seven, almost eight feet tall, and nothing had bloomed yet. And I thought to myself, wow, well, that was, that was a bad experiment. These are just massive weeds sitting in my, my side yard. We began to thinking, well, maybe I should just dig them up. Like, this is, uh, I was getting kind of impatient with them. But about midway through August, the tallest of the, of the plants formed this little bud, and eventually it popped, and this bright yellow flower formed. And I thought, okay, I'll give it a little bit more time. And within a week or two, I had all of these beautiful sunflowers. That first bud, that first sunflower, was a sign that more was yet to come. Christ is not the only one who will experience resurrection life. He promises that all who follow him will experience the great joy of having air rush back into our lungs. That's the promise that we have. You see, when we think about this idea of first fruits, our whole understanding of the passage is enriched. We read there that, that yes, through Adam all die, but now through Christ we will all live. There's an order to resurrection. Christ first, and then all of those who belong to Christ will follow. Christ's resurrection has has initiated a sequence of events that will continue on until Christ, that God, is all in all. It's this beautiful reminder to us as we look for evidence for why we believe in this crazy idea of the resurrection. 
Christ is our evidence. The resurrection makes it rational to believe in the resurrection. Christ is, uh, makes it reasonable for us uh, to believe in hope of eternal life. It's the resurrection that makes it rational to have hope when we stand at the bedside of a loved one who is dying. It's the resurrection that gives us a rationale, to, a foundation to stand on when we pour out our lives, believing that this life is not all that there is. Earlier this morning, we sang the lyrics, the, the song, When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look, and I see him there, one Jesus Christ, holy Savior, who made an end to all my sins. Why is it rational to stand up against demonic powers, Satan who calls us to, to shrivel down into guilt and shame? The rationale for being able to stand up and reject temptation is the hope we have in the resurrection. Today, I want to call you uh, to look and consider the good news of the resurrection. And yeah, we might at first have some objections, some skepticism, but don't let that keep you from, like Harry Potter, keeping your eyes shut. I invite you to maybe reconsider some of those objections. Yeah, the good news of the resurrection, it's almost too good for us to, to fully comprehend, but it's true nonetheless. And so as we move to the last part of our passage today, I want to I give you two really proactive things you can do to cultivate confidence in the resurrection. Like I said, it's, it's tough uh, to believe sometimes when we hear good news. And it's really sometimes because there's, there's other forces that are pushing back against us. And in the last paragraph of our, our passage today, Paul actually points out two like, corrupting forces that hinder us from taking hold of the resurrection hope. He says that it's the company you keep and the sins that you continue to do that hinder you from embracing the truth of the resurrection. So I first want to, I want to point out to you the shaping power of community. In the final verses, actually 34, 33 and 34, we, we actually get a whole bunch of some uh, imperatives, some applications. Paul packs all of his application right here at the very end of our passage. And the first one, the first imperative in our passage comes in verse 33 when he says, Don't be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Kind of sounds like something your mom would tell you before you go out to play with friends. This isn't some rallying cry to abandon the world and try to just hunker down together and avoid the world. Rather, this is a rallying cry that reminds us what we need in order to live in the world. We need community that's going to help us to hang on to the hope we have in the resurrection. You know, arranging your life according to the resurrection, with resurrection hope, believing that, that this life isn't all that there is, is going to look strange to the rest of the world. It's going to feel weird. It's going to look odd. In verses 29 through 32, leading up to this, this imperative to don't be deceived, Paul actually talks about how strange our lives would look if there is no resurrection. Look at verse 29. He says, otherwise, what, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus, if the dead are not raised? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If there is no resurrection, the, really the only rational way to live is, is a life that simply embraces the moment, for there is no tomorrow. Eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. The only rational way to live then would be to seek pleasure and to be selfish in the moment because this is all that there is. And Paul says, if we're not going to, if we're going to reject that way of viewing the world and believe that there's more to come, it's going to look strange to everyone around us. He, he talks about this whole idea of being baptized on behalf of the dead. And I just want to pause for a moment and try to talk about that and address that for a moment. You might be wondering, what on earth is that? What does he mean by this? And Sure, it is it's a little bit hard to decipher because Paul doesn't really explain what is going on when he says that, that people were being baptized on behalf of the dead. But one thing that we can say whenever we come across a hard passage or we don't really understand it is ask the question, what does other scriptures say? What, other, what are other scriptures saying that help us to know what's going on here? And so we, when we look at other scriptures, we know that what couldn't be going on here is that, that they're being baptized somehow to save those who have already died. We know that baptism doesn't save us. It's though a sign, a reminder of, of the resurrection hope we have. 
And so in some way, whatever activity, Paul doesn't really actually condemn, nor does he really condone this being baptized on behalf of the dead, but he points to this community who together were trying to remind each other that they had life in Christ. He goes on to then talk about his own life and how it would look strange for him to continue to face the beasts of Ephesus, which he really is referring to his enemies in Ephesus, people who did not like him, who tried to try to kill him. He said, it would be weird for me to, to keep pressing in if there is no resurrection. You see, arranging your life according to the resurrection hope, it's going to take a little bit of effort. It's going to take some intentionality. We need community to rearrange our lives. Flannery O'Connor says, we need to push as hard as the age that pushes against you. And I just want to tell you today that the age of this world is pushing against you in immense ways. And on your own, you don't have enough strength. But with community, with others around you linking arms with you, you do have strength to push back. I believe every life is shaped by one of two promises. Either you shape your life on the promise that there is going to be a tomorrow, that there is resurrection hope, and you live accordingly, or you live according to the promise that there is nothing beyond this. You place your faith in the idea that there is actually nothing that will meet you upon death. And so you live your life for yourself. Two promises. And for us, in order to hang on to the promise of the resurrection, we need other people around us to hang on to it, to believe it, to embrace it. Paul thus comes to verse 33 and says, don't be deceived which one of those promises is actually true. Bad company ruins good morals. Christian community isn't just so that you have some people to hang out with on the weekends, so you don't, just so you don't feel lonely living in the city. No, there is far more purpose and far more power in community than I think we often realize. There's a scene in Lord of the Rings where Frodo is about to go off on this big adventure, and he's sitting around with a couple of his friends, and he's kind of doubting whether his friends should come along with him, and his friends look at Frodo and say, look, we're coming with you. You can trust us with your life. You can trust us to keep your secrets, but there's one thing you can't trust us with. You can't trust us to let you go off and face danger alone. It's that kind of thick community that we need today. That kind of thick community that won't let us be deceived. A type of thick community that's going to help us to keep pressing on in the truth of the resurrection. So if you're struggling to believe the resurrection is true, then I would ask you, who are you hanging out with? Who are the people shaping you? Are they helping or hurting? Join a community group if you haven't already. Consider starting an ICC, an intentional Christian community. Consider joining one of those places and get yourself in a web of relationships with other people who are going to help you along. Prioritize being here on Sunday mornings. Laura and I have talked recently about how many of you have actually ministered to us by simply showing up on Sunday mornings. I know for a fact that there's a lot of you who have, have kids, and getting here on a Sunday morning is like Mount Everest, and you conquer it every Sunday, and you're here, and when I see you, it, it makes me so joyful. It strengthens me. And I know for a lot of you in the medical industry, you've just finished a 24-hour shift, and yet you showing up here on Sunday morning, man, it ministers, it strengthens me, it gives me confidence in what I believe. And I know some of you are here this morning, and you're just in a season of suffering and in hardship, and it's taken everything in you to show up here on Sunday morning. And I got to tell you, man, that, that, that helps me so much to see your faith pressing on. So if you need some help this morning believing the resurrection, I encourage you to just simply listen and see the people around you today. Two habits to cultivate confidence in the resurrection. The first one is find community, and the second one I want to offer you today is simply to fight sin. We turn here to the last verse in our passage. Paul ends with some pretty strong language. He says, Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Sometimes we need that gentle encouragement, correction, and sometimes you just need a bucket of cold water to get you to wake up. Paul's coming to the end of his letter, and he's throwing it all out there on the table, saying, Wake up from your drunken stupor, and stop sinning. 
Sin has a way of distorting our sense of reality. Sin doesn't stay where it begins. Sin, it's like a two-year-old. If you don't give it its attention, it'll find its way to get your attention. It's not something that can be left alone. It's not some weed that needs to be cut back. It needs to be rooted out of your life as a way of multiplying. Sin just multiplies and multiplies until you deal with it. So this morning, I want to call you to, to join this good fight against sin. Soldiers are motivated to go into battle for either one of two reasons. Either it's their just complete hatred of the wickedness of the enemy, or I think something more powerful of a motivation to go into battle is the great reward that lies before them. The people for which they love, the things that they are fighting for, family and freedom. And I think in, the, in our church and in, in Christian culture, sometimes we call people to fight sin by simply telling you how awful sin is. And that is true, but I want to give you another motivation this morning for fighting sin. And it's the glorious reward of the resurrection that awaits us. There's a Puritan, C.J. Ryle. I know a lot of people think Puritans are just old dead folks who really didn't have much joy in life. But Puritans actually had a sense of joy and a sense of the, the resurrection hope that I think we could learn from. C.J. Ryle, he wrote this book called Fight for Holiness, Fighting for Holiness. Listen to what he says. He says, let us settle it in our minds that the Christian fight, it's a good fight, a really good fight, truly good, emphatically good. We see only part of it as yet. We see the struggle, but not the end. We see the campaign, but not the reward. We see the cross, but not the crown. We see a few humble, broken, spirited, penitent, praying people, enduring hardship and despised by the world, but we see not the hand of God over them, the face of God smiling on them, the kingdom of glory prepared for them. These things are yet to be revealed. If you need help settling it in your mind that the fight against sin is a fight worth fighting, I invite you to consider the resurrection, the hope of life eternal, of joy unending. We're called to fight this battle <laughs> against sin because it's sin that has a way of corrupting our ability to fully grasp and believe in the truth of the gospel. So if you're struggling to believe the resurrection is true, I invite you to just take stock. Is there any sin in my life that just needs dealt with? Maybe start there. See, our fight, it isn't so much a fight as it is a call to join the victory march of Christ that will not stop until we have seen that all have seen his glory. We, this morning, I've, as I've been talking about, we believe that the resurrection is good news, such good news that it's almost hard for us to believe. And so, yeah, let's address the objections. Let's cultivate habits that help us build some confidence in us. But let's believe that the resurrection has ripped this irreparable hole in our world where life and light are streaming in. In a world with endless threats, we have endless hope. That's what the resurrection gives us. Hope that rises to every occasion. Hope that, that doesn't disappoint. The resurrection is what gives us the ability to look into places of darkness and see light. The resurrection hope is what lets us, Holy Trinity Church, believe that our city, which is torn up by violence and corruption, and we believe that God can transform it. It's a resurrection hope that allows us to look at our children who may be caught up in sin and believe that God's not done with them yet. It's resurrection hope that allows us on the days where we have sinned and fallen short and yet we're able to stand back up and push back against Satan's lies because we know that Christ is risen. It's a resurrection hope that allows us to, in the face of sickness, to sing songs of praise. Resurrection hope rises to every occasion. It's hope that makes living possible. In a world where we're just constantly given a diet of bad news, we have good news that outlasts, that's stronger than, that is more hopeful than anything else. So if you're looking for some hope this morning, I invite you to come and see the empty tomb. See that the stone is rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. Hallelujah. God be praised. He is risen from the grave.
Would you pray with me? Oh, gracious and merciful Father, I come to you because I believe that you are not done working in our congregation, Lord, that you are not done working in our lives, that, Father, we, we need the resurrecting strength to do a work in us. Father, I pray with all confidence that you can bring life where there is death. I believe this with confidence because Christ is risen from the dead. The tomb is empty and we have hope, endless hope. So, Father, I pray today that we don't just leave this space with a little bit more confidence, but rather we leave this place with a hope, a hope that rises to every occasion. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me as we worship our risen King, Jesus Christ, and for what he did for us on the, grave, or on the, on the cross? Um, at this time, kids are going to rejoin us. Uh, we'll be taking communion after this song, um, so they're going to join us for communion. Let's sing.
Welcome back in to all kids who are in Kid City just now. We uh, come to the time in our service where we take communion together. And I know uh, for, the, for the folks who are here in the sermon, uh, the kids are a little... I got this mic on there. Okay. Maybe that's better. Excellent. Our kids were just over in Kid City learning about the story of uh, David and Goliath, the story where David conquers the giant Goliath. God, through Christ, uh, is our conqueror, our savior. Here's a meal that we take once a month to remind ourselves that God does incredible things, that God is the one who secures victory for us. We spoke about in a service just now that that we need things that help cultivate in us confidence in the resurrection. And God gave us communion to help us to cultivate that confidence. That God's able to bring life where there is death. That God gives hope to those who feel as if there is no hope. So today, as we partake of this meal together, I hope that you come and, and you feel strengthened by this meal. And this is a meal that is meant to, to help you know that, know that as surely as you taste of these elements, as surely as you taste of the wine or the juice, you can have certainty that the dead will rise again. Today, this is a meal for those who proclaim Christ as their savior, those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And so if that is not your confession, we invite you to let this meal pass you by, not as a, simply as a, a way to keeping you up, but rather to show you the way in, to invite you to come, and once you've made that confession, to come and celebrate and partake of this meal together. I invite you then during this time as we eat of this meal to just simply consider and contemplate the good news that would come if you believe that there is resurrection. As we partake of this meal in just a moment, too, I, I want you to be aware of, of the family of God around you, uh, to know that you are not alone in believing that the resurrection is true. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is the, my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. For as often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. In a moment, I'm going to pray. And as I pray, I'll ask that the communion service will come forward. And uh, after we uh, have the elements set up, I'll invite you to come forward. And there'll be two stations on both sides of me. Um, and you can come up through these two aisles and return back to the outside. There'll be uh, wine and juice that you can choose from. They'll be labeled uh, on the tray. Uh, but at this time, uh, would you join with me in prayer? Let's pray. Gracious Father, we come uh, with this simple meal of a little bit of bread and a little bit of juice. And we know that you, you can use these simple items, these simple elements, to do incredible things. Like strengthen us uh, for what you've called us to do. To believe in the hope of the resurrection. So Father, as we partake of this meal together, might you, Lord, to a supernatural work of strengthening us and our faith and our confidence. Father, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
The meal is prepared, so come and celebrate. Bye.
Christ's body was broken for you so that you might one day experience full healing and resurrection. Take a knee. Christ's blood was shed for you so that one day you might be cleansed and healed by his blood. Take and drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim his death until he comes. Let's stand together now and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Today, as you leave this space, I, I want you to just let your mind wander to the good news of the resurrection. At the end of the book of Luke, when uh, the word begins to spread that the, ten, the tomb was empty, we find these words. It says, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by, by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Holy Trinity Church, Christ is risen. Go home today with the peace and hope of the resurrection and marvel at what has happened. Amen. Amen.